and thank you all so much for being here. It's a real delight to get to talk to Anna about this book, The Restless Republic, which is by far the most brilliant book about this period I've ever read. One of the things that I want to draw out about it is that it's so readable. But to begin, Anna, what is your book about? <laughs> Um, yes, we ought to get our coordinates. So my book is about a decade in British history that is often skipped over. So it's the decade from the year 1649, which is the year that the King of England, also the King of Scotland and Ireland, was executed for treason. At the end of the Civil War, so the Civil War has been fought over the previous seven or eight years within the British Isles. Um, and it covers the, the period of time between Charles I's execution and the decision uh, 11 years later to invite his son, Charles II, to um, return from exile and uh, uh, the monarchy then being reinstituted. So it's, el it's 11 years in British history where the um, islands were didn't have a monarchy um, and all of the kind of institutions associated with the monarchy, including the House of Lords, the traditional Church of England, and much more beside was completely done away with. So it's the, it's the English or British Revolution, if you like, and, the, uh, and its consequences, which of course at the time nobody knew was going to, as it were, be, you know, have a kind of end point to it a decade later. Um, so, of course, the way this book is told is through the eyes of a series of people who were key players, who touched and were touched by this moment of startling British revolution. Um, and I guess two of the most important players to think about at the beginning would be the King and Cromwell. So could you briefly paint us a picture? What kind of man was Charles I? So Charles I um, is a, a, a figure who, um, looms large over British history, but he was very, very small. He was a small man um, and a very, um, uh, a, a very particular one. He had been born in Scotland because a crucial bit of background to this period is that um, uh, Charles I's father, James I, was the King of Scotland who inherited the throne of England when he was an adult. And so he brought his family from Edinburgh down to London and set up shop, as it were, in this new kingdom that he had inherited. And so James I was the, the first person to be king of both England and Scotland. They remain completely two separate nations. They just shared a king as would happen um, uh, in later centuries with other nations, Hanover and um, uh, the, the United Provinces. So uh, Charles I was a sort of second generation, if you like, um, uh, sort of member of this, this new um, London court. Uh, and he was very, very fastidious. He, was, um, he loved art. He was a great collector of paintings and sculpture. Um, he was um, a great a, a lover of beauty um, and of order. And he was really um, concerned with ensuring that the dignity of monarchy was upheld. And this would be very important because it meant that he disliked uh, contact with his subjects in the great sort of ceremonial set pieces, um, uh, entries into the city of London or uh, coronation processions, this sort of thing that were part of the kind of language of royalty. Um, but also, crucially, he liked his worship in church to be very sort of beautiful and ceremonious. He liked lots of incense, he loved vestments, he loved um, uh, the iconography of the church, which was anathema to um, particularly his Scottish subjects and others as well. And this would be part of his undoing, essentially. So, with the undoing, into this world, into this quite precise king, comes Oliver Cromwell. Who was Cromwell? Yeah, well, Cromwell's a, a fascinating figure, and he is very much associated with this period. But actually, um, Oliver Cromwell, during the course of the Civil War that gave rise to the revolution, um, was a soldier. I mean, he wasn't a politician. He wasn't, a, he wasn't even head of the army. He was one of a number of senior um, soldiers. Um, but he was somebody who, during the course of the decade of the Republic, would be drawn, um, and it, he was drawn by circumstances rather than it being his goal, into a position of um, or sort of authority and primacy. 
But like a lot of other people who were around in the course of the Civil War, he was, during the, the time of Charles I's life, one of um, the uh, co kind of committed uh, uh, Protestants, Calvinists if you like, who saw Charles I's desire to make church wor worship more ceremonious, more ritualistic, as uh, uh, as evidence that he was trying to take the English church back to, Cath to Catholicism. And this was what terrified people um, in England because they saw it as, uh, as quite wrong and as likely to bring God's wrath down on the nation in a very immediate and catastrophic sense. Right. I think one of the fascinating things about this period is the amount of wrath that was being prophesied is enormous. Just constant wrath. Wrath, yeah. um, Wall uh, to wall wrath. One of the things I loved that you mentioned earlier, what I'd love you just to mention again because I don't think we have the same audience. One of the ways that you were trying when you were writing this to keep Cromwell human with his death mask. Yeah, so when I started writing this book, I was, because, I was, because those people who were responsible for the trial and execution of Charles I, often called the Puritans, um, are a pretty kind of hardcore community of uh, committed uh, kind of Christian radicals and um, very militaristic. They were, you know, they were a lot of them in the army. They, they can be pretty hard to love. And I thought, if I'm going to write about this decade, I cannot come upon it in an attitude that the sort of one lot is kind of lovable and one lot isn't. There's a very nice little um, line in a, a, a famous English historical satire called 1066 and all that, which describes the Civil War as a fight between the um, cavaliers who were wrong but romantic and the roundheads who were right but repulsive. And this is a kind of, um, this is a trap you can fall into and I didn't want to fall into coming to write about this period as it were on the side or feeling, you know, that I was um, sort of cheering for one side or the other. And so um, I've got uh, at home a, a copy of a death mask of Oliver Cromwell that was made from his corpse when he died. It's quite a common thing that happened in the 17th century to capture the image of the dead person. And I, I've got a cast of it and I kept it on my desk so that I would, to really make sure that I reminded myself constantly that these were people too, you know, that the, 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 those who, whose kind of zealotry can be very off-putting or rather kind of, you know, unappealing, were also human beings who were trying to do what they thought was right and to the, to the kind of benefit of humanity. And I would look him in the eye and I would sort of remind myself he was a father, he was a husband, you know, he was a brother. And yeah, I found it quite helpful. I think it's a magnificent thing. I, if I could find death masks of the people I write about, I would, to, to remember they lived. Um, so very briefly, and this is difficult because it's a long piece of history, but why did they kill Charles as swiftly as one can? Yeah. Why did they kill the king? So um, Charles I was executed more or less um, as a kind of... Um, not quite an accident, but it hadn't been the, it hadn't been the goal. The Civil War is fought in, in Britain over religion, principally, over different views of what the religious um, sort of settlement of state of the kingdom should be, and, and to a degree over how extensive the king's rights should be. Um, the, the royalists lost, so militarily the parliamentarians, those who want to, 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 to change what Charles I was doing, won. And they were desperate to do a deal with Charles I where he would agree to reform the church along the lines they wanted and to have his powers um, his, curtailed, not drastically, but a bit, call Parliament to do various things. And he absolutely wouldn't do it. And because he wouldn't do it, he said, I, you know, this, is, this is to, you know, it, if, I if I concede these things, you know, then the institution of monarchy itself is being sort of undermined. Um, uh, uh, he, the, the consequence was he ended up being put on trial and he refused to enter a plea in his trial. Quite often happens with the trial, as we see it with 20th century political trials, uh, because he wouldn't acknowledge the authority of the court that was trying him. He said, you have no right to try me. There's no precedent for this. And because uh, a no, the, you know, not entering a plea in the system at the time was equivalent to pleading guilty, he was found guilty and he was executed. And so into this sudden moment of chaos, into this sudden break with continuity, the book looks at a number of lives. And I wanted just to touch on a few of them to get a flavor of this moment. So first, I was wondering if I could hear about 
Jared Wynn Stanley, um, who he, one of the things that you quote him saying, into this chaos there will always come reformers. And you quote him as saying, England hath lain under the power of that beast, kingly property. But now England is the first of the nations that is upon the point of reforming. How did he go about trying to change Britain? Yes, yeah, so one of the fascinating things about this period is because there's in the rhetoric and the kind of discussions around um, the challenging the king's authority and then putting him on trial, the incredibly uplifting language was used about freedom and about peace and about a new way of doing things. And this was, um, this was sort of seized upon um, by a number of different people who took from it what they chose. Uh, and because the licensing laws, which until this point had prevented publications from going to press, which weren't officially endorsed by the government, had, had basically lapsed during this period because of the war, masses of things went into print that would never otherwise have been allowed with ideas about what kind of form of government you might have, what sort of form of worship might be appropriate, what you know, the nature of um, human existence was. And an, an incredible sort of garden of um, exotic ideas sprouted up as a consequence. And one of the people responsible for this is a chap called Gerald Wynne Stanley, who, was a, who had been a, um, a cloth merchant in London. He'd had a, his business had failed. Uh, as lots of people's did because civil war caused a lot of economic dislocation. And he had an emotional breakdown and he went to be a, a, essentially a kind of herdsman in the countryside. And one day when he was herding his cattle, he had an epiphany. He had a religious or a, a kind of, not really, well, an emotional or um, sort of spiritual epiphany. And he, set, he for suddenly saw that with all the land and all property, well, instead of belonging to individuals, belonged to everybody, then there would be enough um, in the way of resources to feed everyone. And no one need go hungry, and no one need be without. And so it, it was a kind of proto-communism, absolutely. And he, he stepped forth wide-eyed with this idea, and he recruited a whole lot of people from the town he lived in to come with him onto some common ground which was um, un cultivated to plant vegetables. It's a very kind of touching embodiment of a sort of um, a campaigning ideal um, on the basis that if we all work together and we all plant these vegetables and we all own them you know, collectively, then you know, the sin of property will be expunged and this, this promised kind of freedom will result. Um, and they were called the diggers. And uh, because newspapers were taking off at this time, which we might come on to talk about, suddenly, although this was quite a small group of people, it, they, their doings were talk, the talk of the kingdom. These, and this, these sort of strange, um, idealistic, vegetable-growing <laughs> um, men of Cobham in Surrey. Um, uh, but it's an idea, you know, the idea, essentially, of common ownership as a novel concept of this age, which was an incredibly important one, and actually came to be referenced you know, a lot, actually, in, in um, uh, the kind of discussion around you know, Marxian sort of um, ideology much, much later. So, as you say, the other thing is this eruption of newspapers, of possible newsprint, and at the heart of that is Marchmont Needham, uh, everyone's favorite sort of serial turncoat. What do you call him? The um, piebald chameleon. <laughs> Can you tell us about what he did and how often he did it? So one of the fascinating things about this period is, just like our own, actually, the advent of a new medium was a hugely influential factor in political and social change. In our age, of course, it's been the internet, but in the 17th century, it was the newspaper. So um, a generation before the period I'm writing about, newspapers did not exist. There was no national news in Europe. Um, if you wanted to know what was happening in Paris, in the parliament there, or in, um, in The Hague, or in London, you had, to, you had to have a correspondent there who would write you a letter and tell you what was happening. But then suddenly, in the 1620s, uh, the concept of a uh, published weekly um, uh, news sheet that would tell you and anybody what was happening in the affairs of the world uh, and available very cheaply kind of erupted. And um, it, the, the, the discussions and the disputes and the kind of um, political turmoil of a civil war was like a wind to a spark to this new medium. And suddenly, um, uh, uh, newspapers are being produced hand over fist and everybody is reading them. 
Um, and with newspapers come, of course, all the things that we know about news, which is you have editors, and therefore you have editorial influence, you have correspondence, you have advertising, you have distribution, all of these things came into being. And I, when I was writing this book, I really wanted to explore how much difference that made. And I, I chose as my sort of protagonist, because my story is told through nine protagonists, um, uh, the great newspaper man of the age, who was called Marchmont Needham. And what's very interesting about him is that he was a good typifier of the fact that although there was a civil war and a big argument about whether there should be a monarchy or not, um, most people in, in Britain took neither side. They just kind of wanted to keep their heads down. They wanted to hold on to their property and you know, marry their daughters and do all the things that people you know, were worried about. Uh, and then there were those who saw it as an opportunity to make some money. And Marchmont Needham was one of those. So he became a newspaper publisher uh, and he kind of tacked between the sides uh, to try to follow, um, you know, where the kind of uh, the, the greatest chances of success were. So he started off as publishing for um, a parliamentarian paper, then he moved to a royalist paper, then he goes back to, to, to work for the government again. Each time managing to change sides more or less exactly the wrong moment, just as the side he was abandoning were about to get the upper hand. So in contrast to Marchmont Needham, who managed to change his mind without, like, flinching, we have a vision of somebody whose absolute certainty uh, shook the world. So, and also, one of the things I love about this book is she is a woman, and you are able to write about several women vividly. So, so the Countess of Derby, a, a redoubtable and extraordinary figure. Could you briefly tell us about how she sort of held on to her position. Yeah, so one of the fascinating things about this, this period is the role of women. I mean, rim, women really come to the fore in the mid-17th century in a way that you don't see um, other than, you know, if you happen to be the queen or, you know, the, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of exceptional position like that, really, uh, historically, in um, British history before. It's partly because war is always changes the lot of women because men are fighting and so there's a kind of drawing of women into spheres they're not normally in. Um, and for other reasons which we'll talk about. But uh, in this case, the figure that I um, travel with for a part of the book uh, was a great royalist um, uh, noblewoman, Charlotte Countess of Derby. She was actually French. She married into one of the great English families. Her husband went off to um, join the royalists uh, in an attempt to re-establish the monarchy in the two years into the Republic. And she is left alone defending the only remaining royalist bit of British soil, which is the Isle of Man, which is a little island in the kind of middle of the kind of archipelago of the British Isles. She's there on her own. She's 50 years old. She's m tough as old boots. And she is determined that, that sh she will not surrender this island to the victorious um, Republican government. And she, she essentially stands alone there uh, and it's uh, uh, defending it herself on horseback with the rem remnants of her family and her husband's retainers, but mostly kind of, you know, all the men have gone to fight. So it's sort of the locksmith, you know, the chaplain, her daughters. Um, and she, she will not surrender. And even when the parliamentary army lands several thousand men with cannon, heavy artillery, and so on, she refuses to surrender. In the end, she's betrayed and the, uh, the, the island is taken. But in her kind of final act of defiance, she signs the, um, the articles of surrender, but refuses to read a single word of what they say because it's her kind of act of defiance against the whole, um, the whole business. I've always loved her. Yeah, no, um, she's, she's, she's a sort of, uh, she is brilliantly portrayed in this and her kind of ruthlessness with herself and others is yes, remarkable. I, you wouldn't want yeah. her as your mother. No, absolutely no. not. <laughs> um, and then another woman that you address is Anna Trapnell, who is a kind of visionary. And one of the things that I love that you do is write about the ways some of this moment of chaos and discontinuity allowed strange figures to arise, and she is one of the strangest. Yes, yeah, so she is, she's a, uh, Anna Trapnell's a young woman who was a visionary. And one of, again, the fascinating things about this period is um, because the 
the Church of England, the normal structure of uh, worship and the relationship between the people and God basically fell apart during this period. And uh, uh, the, the Puritans believed that people's relationships with God didn't have to be administered by a kind of priest figure, but could be a direct relationship between you and God. Uh, that meant that for the first time, women, instead of having their relationship with God mediated by a priest or attending church with their husband, uh, could, could, could speak of a, a direct relationship with God and things that he had showed to them. And Anna Trapnell came to the fore. She was the daughter of a shipwright, came very much from the kind of lower rungs of society. Um, and she started having visions which foretold things that then went on actually to happen. So she had a vision that, um, that uh, Charles I would be executed. She had a vision that um, Oliver Cromwell would come to the fore and would do certain things, which then several days later did indeed happen. And she became an absolute celebrity. And um, hundreds and hundreds of people kind of, you know, flocked to her little house and to the various places that she stayed to, to, to hear what she was going to say. And then the, someone was a, a given the job of sitting down and trying to, to make out her mumblings, to write them down and then publish them. And she became a kind of um, a, a, a sort of figure who was adopted by uh, those in the end who were critical of Oliver Cromwell because she started then to foretell things which were to his disadvantage and, um, and kind of used her as a sort of campaign tool to put a political argument. But the fact that this was about a woman, a kind of working class young woman, in not married, um, very, very respectable, um, and, and her, her kind of ability to tell you what was on God's mind, which is, of course, the one thing everybody wanted to know about everything at this period, made her incredibly powerful. And it was an absolute upending of the sort of position somebody like her would ever otherwise have had in a different age. Exactly. And of course, she ends up in jail for a while. And even that doesn't change the way that she continues to, to insist on what she believes to be true. It is an extraordinary tale. Yeah, no, um, it is. And I was really keen in writing this book not just to be talking about what the experience was of, you know, people at the sort of top end of society who's, who, you know, for whom the archives tend to be good. I wanted to know about what was it like if you, you know, this is a single unmarried woman from, you know, a trade background and who's a sort of, you know, uh, lives a life and has a set of experiences quite unlike those we normally talk about. Because I really wanted to know what was it like to live through those years and to experience the kind of upheaval that um, happened, which of course has no precedent in, in uh, well, certainly in British history and, 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 and pretty much no precedent in European history. Um, in fact, a technical question. How did you find out about someone like Anna Trapnell, about whom relatively little is known? What was your process for uncovering her? So the wonderful thing is because printing took off in this period, um, it gives you a, a body of sources in print as well as in manuscript, which you wouldn't otherwise have. So just to give you an idea, so in, in 1500, there were about uh, 50 books a year published in Britain. By 1600, it's about 200 books a year. By 1650, it's about 4,000 books a year. So there's this a massive escalation in print and publication, which means that there is a kind of body of uh, things being committed to print and therefore um, in multiple editions and therefore likely to survive, which you really don't get. If you're going back to Henry VIII's reign, that's, you, know, it's, it's, it, you don't get that. So for Anna Trapnell, because she was such a celebrity at the time, what she said was printed and published in you know, 1650, 51, 52. And so those survive as uh, printed materials in the British Library and other places. And you can, if you take those, and they're incredibly long, with very rambling <laughs> accounts of you know, her, her strange visions of and then, a, and then a tree turned white. And you know, it's very sort of slightly sh shaggy dog story territory. But it, you know, in among it, you can, you can really kind of build up a picture of what the, you know, the, the thing she's referencing, the world she's inhabiting. And then you can essentially cross-reference that with being able to establish from other source materials, diaries, letters, um, people saying, I went to see the young visionary at Whitehall, you know, she's her third day of being in a trance and, you know, such and such happened. So it's, it's, it's a lovely period to work on because it's just, you're just at that up turn of the curve of evidence, which means as well as the manuscript material, you've also got printed material to, to kind of, yeah, to use alongside. I work on roughly the same period and my friends who are medievalists are so jealous yeah. <laughs> the amount of paper we have. Um, one of the things I love about this book, 
and one of the reasons you should all read it is it is history that feels alive and it feels alive because the writing has a kind of insistence on vividness. Um, it has such power that I thought um, I would just ask you to read. So this is the beginning of William Petty's uh, entrance into your story and it's just two paragraphs, three paragraphs. If you can just read this first bit. Um, that would be absolutely wonderful, just to give a taste. It's also a vision of, of the sort of lurid strangeness of this period. Yes. Okay, this is the beginning of a chapter. William Petty may well have been in the crowd that gathered to watch the execution of Anne Green in the yard of Oxford Castle. He lived just a short stroll away, and he stood to benefit directly from her death. Anne was a 22-year-old domestic servant convicted of murdering her child. It was cold, the 14th of December, 1650, as the stout young woman ascended the ladder to the projecting beam and the noose which was shortly to strangle her. Her time was short. She fixed her eyes on the executioner and said she hoped God would forgive her accusers before singing a few lines of a psalm. The noose was placed about her neck and seconds later she was pushed from the steps. She fell, and the line snapped straight, arresting her drop with a sickening jolt. For almost half an hour, she hung there, her not inconsiderable weight suspended from the rope around her throat. To ensure her neck was indeed broken, her limp body was lifted up and jerked down repeatedly, and a soldier struck her chest hard with the butt of his musket. This done, she was cut down and dropped into the waiting coffin where she was stamped on three times for good measure. Whether or not he witnessed her execution, William Petty was intensely interested in the demise of Anne Green. He had never met her and cared not a jot for her life or the justice or otherwise of her sentence. What interested him was her corpse, for dead bodies... Especially fresh ones were hard to come by. Soon after his arrival in Oxford, he had arranged for a body to be brought up river from Reading, but it had been necessary to pickle it first to prevent putrefaction. A cured cadaver was all very well, but its use was limited when the living body you toiled to understand. Sorry, when it was the living body you toiled to understand. The coffin containing the corpse of Anne Green was then carried through Oxford to a medieval house on the south side of the high street. Here, over an apothecary's shop, were William Petty's own rooms. His colleague and fellow doctor, Thomas Willis, arrived promptly to join him in the dissection they were about to perform. With the blood still warm in her veins, Anne Green was a thrilling prospect to these two young men, their minds alive with the possibilities of Dr. Harvey's radical contention that blood did not simply travel outwards from the heart, as had always been thought, but passed around the human body in a continuous circuit. It was only when they approached, their blades now just inches from her ashen flesh, that a faint rattling sound came to their ears, and with it, the realisation that Anne Green was still alive. Thank you so much. So, <laughs> bravo. So, what happened to Anne Green and to William Petty? What does their relationship become? Well, so, um, this, this, so this poor woman who hadn't actually murdered her child, but had, had, had been... Sorry? Completely innocent. This is completely thing, innocent. This She'd, she, was a, she was a domestic servant in a house. She'd been seduced by the sort of young grandson of the owner, and she had become pregnant, and then she had miscarried quite late in her pregnancy, and this had been seen as evidence that she had somehow deliberately killed this um, baby. Um, and, and hence her um, conviction. Um, uh, but the, the, William Petty and his group of young medical men, these are the young men who would, at the Restoration, rename themselves the Royal Society. This time they were called the Oxford Philosophical Society. Um, they, having realised as they were about to dis dissect her that she was still alive, turned their attentions from cutting her up to trying to kind of tend her back to some kind of life to see whether they, you know, whether she was, uh, you know, might be revived. 
And amazingly, after this awful experience of being hanged for half an hour and all the other things, um, with their attention, with kind of careful monitoring of her, with administering of um, various kind of um, uh, sort of uh, cures and things to try to sustain her, they managed within the week to have her up and about and um, uh, 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 kind of able to eat and drink and well again. And um, it was an amazing thing because, first of all, she became a kind of celebrity because uh, she was the person who'd come back from the dead. And all of them became celebrities, particularly William Petty, who'd led this, as being someone who had been able, able to revive a dead person. Now, of course, what they'd actually done was to, you know, to, to, to kind of minister to somebody who wasn't dead. But their, um, the sort of new science, because this is the age of the new science, this is the beginning of what we would consider to be proper scientific research based on experimentation, on um, you know, a, a, a careful kind of carrying out of exercises where you change different elements of them in order to establish the cause and medical cause and effect. This was completely new. And the revival of Anne Green, Brought, which spread across the nation and in March McNeedham in his newspaper, Mercurius Politicus, you know, it was like headline news, the revival of this dead girl, um, brought a new credibility to the scientific endeavors of these young men, which until this point were looked on as being very strange and unorthodox and probably quite wrong. Um, and that credibility was part of what saw, as I say, what we would consider to be modern scientific research and and processes become mainstream, which is one of the great innovations of this period, uh, with people like um, Robert Boyle who, and um, um, uh, Robert Hooke and, you know, lastly, Isaac Newton and so on coming, coming to the fore. Brilliant. So exactly. A moment of so many unforeseen consequences. Yeah, yeah um, quite so. We have about 10 minutes left, and so I want to make sure that we, let's get Charles back on the throne. Um, how, because one of the things about history, of course, is like, the suspense is limited. We've all read Prince Harry's book. We know we still have a monarchy. How did we get back to the stage of Charles II being placed back on the throne? So, as I said, the thing is that when the monarchy was abolished in 1649, um, as far as anybody knew, that was going to be it. You know, that was the end of the monarchy. Uh, and, you know, we're never going to see it again. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, the years passed. And as I say, the House of Lords was abolished. Uh, the, the, the institution of monarchy itself was abolished. The royal estates were all sold. Crown jewels were put up for sale and melted down. You know, it was comprehensive. But the difficulty was that um, the new, there was agreement on what, among some people at least, on what wasn't wanted. There was agreement that, um, that monarchy had real shortcomings in, as an institution. But crucially, there hadn't been any discussion of what a better arrangement might be and what that might look like. It's quite a kind of cautionary tale, this. And so um, during the course of the, the decade, um, various different formulations of the republic come and go, and they are all basically deeply unstable because the fundamental underlying problem was that if you had had a kind of plebiscite of any description, if you'd had a referendum, you know, including either everybody or, or, or those who were kind of allowed to have a say, they would have voted for the restoration of the monarchy. As in, the abolition of the monarchy had never been the will of enough of the people for it to have real staying power at an, in an age where the idea of a republic in any kind of recognizable modern sense was really very alien. And so what happened was that after the initial attempts to have a kind of pure, monarch, a pure republic um, failed, Oliver Cromwell became, was made Lord Protector, which was sort of a steward of the country, of the republic. He then died in 1658, having completely failed to figure out what was going to happen after his death. Um, and the nation dissolved into basically another you know, near civil war position. And the, uh, the army was very, very powerful. Uh, a, a standing army had been created during the civil, civil war or was a consequence of the civil war because until then, until this period, armies were just groups of men with guns that you gathered together when you wanted to go and fight somebody. There wasn't normally an army on, in peacetime, but there had been an army to, to, uh, to fight the, the parliamentarian cause and then it was kept on to try and kind of stave off rebellion against the republic. Um, so it was a sort of military state, really. Um, but even the army itself and crucially, one of its leaders, George Monk, who was the head of the army in Scotland, came to recognize that this 
state of affairs with endless throwing out of the MPs of Parliament, arresting of you know, senior figures, um, just could not be allowed to continue. It was so... Um, so it was catastrophic e economically for the kingdom. It was extraordinarily unstable in all political senses. And it was, um, it, you know, enjoyed no kind of popular support. So he was responsible for marching his bit of the army from Scotland to London to essentially kind of counter coup the army uh, generals in control in London in a most amazing bit of kind of political and military maneuvering. Um, and what he made possible was a free parliament to meet, which was allowed to meet in the spring of 1660. And once a free parliament was allowed to meet, it voted, as it almost always, almost certainly would have done at any previous point, to invite the son of Charles I, Charles II, who had been living in a, in a sort of inn, in a kind of pub in Frankfurt and other places, to come back and to take the throne. But it was... It was after they had kind of exhausted every other formulation that could be found that this was then, you know, seen as being the, being the only viable option. And how do you think this moment, this sort of wild ten years of British history, has coloured the monarchy going onwards? Well, I think it's... it's the thing about it is, as a constitutional... Um, experiment, it was a failure, you know, self-evidently. We've still got a monarchy. It's quite, you know, it's as stable as, you know, as, despite Prince Harry. I think it's as kind of, you know, st um, sort, of, uh, sort of dug in as it has been in my lifetime at the moment. But um, in so many other ways, the period has really, really changed British history. So in a way, the, the, the resumption of monarchy as a form of government in 1660 disguises the really big changes to, um, to, to, the, to the British Isles and the British kind of polity that came from this period. So just to kind of try and number them, I mean, the idea that Parliament might be the sovereign body, you know, just this kind of radical idea that sovereignty and authority re should reside principally in those elected by different parts of the nation rather than in the kind of titular head was completely um, an innovation of the 1650s. And by the end of the 17th century, that was enshrined essentially in law. Um, so that was, you know, that's pretty crucial innovation. Secondly, the concept of, of um, uh, Britain as a whole, there was a union in this period between England and Scotland. There was a parliament that met in Westminster that had representatives of the whole of the British Isles, bearing in mind that, as I say, until this point, it was just two separate kingdoms that happened to share a king. Crucially, the idea of religious freedom. The 1650s, for all its kind of police state characteristics, was the first time in the history of Britain where it was legally possible to worship in a different way from your neighbor or the, 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 you know, the state-endorsed um, church structures. I mean, that's completely, completely new. And by the end of the century, the Toleration Act would be passed, which enshrined in law that freedom, I mean, not for everybody yet, but for the principle of it and for most people. Um, and then, you know, so many other things, you know, as I say, the, the literacy of the people, the population, engagement in political argument, the reading of um, papers and, you know, being involved in what's happening in Westminster news, you know, you can't put that genie couldn't go back in the box um, after this period. Um, and then lots of other things which were kind of more, um, you know, sort of less sort of big structure things, but because there were lots of prohibitions in this period, um, uh, including the fact the theatres were closed in London during this period because the Republican government was thought that theatres were the place that royalists hung out and you didn't want them getting together and you know, trying to plan a kind of revolution. Uh, but as a consequence, new forms of drama came to the fore, which, which could kind of avoid the strictures of the laws. It's a bit like in COVID, people learn how to do all lots of things that they didn't know how to do before because, because you're forced to by circumstances. So in 1658, um, a bright spark came up with the idea that this thing called opera, you know, which apparently is happening in Italy, uh, might be possible. And so the first opera is performed in London in Covent Garden in 1658 when Oliver Cromwell is sitting on his you know, chair of state because it didn't count as theatre and therefore it was possible. Coffee houses opened um, and this great explosion of science, which was absolutely um, sort of quickened by 
by the sort of liberations of the time, not just physical and sort of institutional, but if it were possible to conceive of abolishing all the bishops, of executing the king, of selling the crown jewels, then what else, what other kind of holy cows might not be challengeable? And all of the kind of medieval understanding of medicine, which was you know, very much based on antiquity, suddenly is being questioned, and that really forms the basis of the scientific revolution in, um, in Europe and uh, a, you know, the beginning of a kind of empirical understanding of the human body and the universe and so on. So, so I think, to me, the thing about this period is that, in many ways, the monarchy looks the, looks the same. Um, you know, you see a state opening a parliament now, it looks exactly like it did in Henry VIII's time. But that disguises, of course, so much, because obviously the monarchy, since the beginning of the 18th century, has been, um, been essentially a ceremonial monarchy. Um, but also, uh, underneath all of that, the, the kind of influences and the, the catalyst, if you like, of the uh, revolutionary years um, really accelerated change that made the nation very different, despite that apparent continuity. I think that is one of the things that the book captures so beautifully, this idea when the king comes back, of course, we call it restoration, but it is a period of wild transformation. You know, Britain was shaken and reformed in this period. And it is, this book captured the, the so many nuanced ways that Britain was transformed. Um, I cannot recommend enough that you read it. It is spectacular. Thank you all so much for coming. And thank you, Dr. Anna Kay.